I'm a composer, contrabassist, and a curator, now living as a freelance artist in Berlin, where I've lived for about 10 years. And in 2016, I finished my PhD at the University of Leiden in Holland. Um, the subject of the dissertation is notation for improvisers in experimental music. I'm not gonna talk too much about the content of that project. I wanted to talk more about the form of it. It was published as a native website. And by that I mean it wasn't written for print and then later put up on the internet as a PDF or what have you, but it was actually written for the medium of the web. And there are several examples of web-based dissertations that have been written over the last 20 years or so. But there's been actually very little written about how one does that and what it means and what are the problems and you know what are the possibilities for different disciplines. So what I'm going to present today is sort of like a collection of war stories, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my experience in building one and the kinds of questions I came up against and the things I discovered about my own research and my own artistic work through the process of writing for this medium. And I also wanted to share some practical thoughts about how one can actually go about that if you're not already ensconced with the discipline of digital writing or digital rhetoric, or you're not a web developer or a graphic designer. Because you can, um, but the solutions are not obvious when you start. So I'm just going to kind of be riffing a bit, again, on my own website here with a brief tour of the structure of it, and then I'll reflect a bit on how it became important at a more profound level. And then we'll have a little shop talk towards the end. I'll show you, you know, what kinds of tools I use to do it and what I did wrong and what I might do next time if I have another opportunity to do a project like this again. I should start by asking, is anybody already working with web-based publication right now? Yeah? Are you technically skilled? <laughs> Uh -huh. But um, afterwards, when I had more information about artistic creation, and now I'm in a part of PhD, I think why not just using something already known? And yes. are, are you planning on doing a, a web based submission? Absolutely. Um, all I want to do is engage in everything challenging about traditional, the conventional the thesis publication. Especially. All right. Well, let's have at it. So uh, the title of the thesis is Tactile Paths on and through notation for improvisers. Although I'm not going to talk too much about the content, it helps to know a little bit about uh, the topic in, in order to understand why I chose the web format to begin with. So the subject of notation for improvisers, it's not particularly new in practice. Um, notation and improvisation have been happy bedfellows for a millennium at least. In Western music, you know, starting with Gregorian chant, and the Guidonian hand, and also up through Renaissance music and Baroque music, the figured bass, and even up until the 19th century, the virtuosic romantic repertoire for piano or violin, it was often expected that the performer would be improvising, that the notation was not at the beginning and the end of the musical process. Uh, also in other cultures, it's quite common in jazz. People work with chord charts or something like Duke Ellington's big band music is full of holes. You know, the, the melodies are written out, but there's a lot of information that's missing, dynamics and uh, repeats and structural things that it was expected that the performers would learn on the spot, that they would absorb what they needed to while they were members of the band, and that they had their own compositional intelligence to bring to the process, and so forth. Um, lots of examples in experimental music from the last 50 or 60 years. But 
In the first half of the 20th century or so, um, notation and improvisation uh, were not widely considered to be compatible ways of making music. Um, through various circumstances, the scientificization of musicology, through modernist compositional discourse, um, various other factors, the, the idea of notation or the score came to be associated with uh, the notion of the musical work, that it's prescribing conditions to play music and it would preserve the work after it was made so that it could be repeated. And uh, improvisation sort of disappeared from both scholarly discourse and practice for a while. And so in the, over the last 50 years, although there have been lots of people who are interested in the nexus of improvisation and notation, uh, not so much scholarly work has been done to understand its terms and its values and the kinds of practices that are, are realized when these two ways of making music are interacting or coming together or what have you. So, um, as I, I've been interested in this topic as an artist for a long time, and so I was familiar with all of the different artists who were working with it. And I was also familiar with all of um, the variety in terms of the styles of notation and the musical aesthetics and uh, sort of the social communities or the, the scenes in which this music operated. And it's, it's a very squirrely topic because it's not like it's happening in one place at one time and it's easy to represent. It's, it's kind of all over the place. And for that, so that makes it a bit difficult to sort of corral conceptually. And it's also difficult to corral because it's not very well documented. A lot of the scores that I'm looking at have never been published. There's, there's not really a repertoire of notation for improvisers. There's a handful of well-known pieces, like Cornelius Cardew's Treatise, for example, or some early pieces by Earl Brown. Um, but these are the exception to the rule. Most of the time, the notation is exchanged between musicians working together. Sometimes it's very ad hoc. Like, I would call up the composers asking for the scores, and they couldn't find it. It was just gone. <laughs> because it was native to a particular set of people he was working with or a particular time, and after that it didn't really have any value for him. So, um, long way of saying that my, my subject had a lot of different sides to represent, and uh, it wasn't clear that my, my readership would be familiar with the materials. They might be familiar with the artists, but it, I was going to have to, to deliver them a kind of a curatorial experience as well as a scholarly argument, so to speak. And so uh, the website was useful, number one, for getting all of these different media together and presenting it in a way that was coherent for people that weren't familiar with it or didn't have access to it as insiders or people who are regularly working in archives and things like that. And uh, websites are very good for that, obviously. It makes for easy integration of video and audio and scores and visual material in addition to the text. Of course, uh, writing a print dissertation, you can do the same thing. You can deliver CDs, you can deliver DVDs, uh, you can deliver appendices with images and so on and so forth, but it's clumsy especially if you're talking about offering, uh, offering readers the ability to compare scores at the same time that they're listening, things like that. It's just the task of you know, putting the CD on, pressing play, going to the score, going back and forth. It's just unnecessarily cumbersome in com compared to what you can do on the web. You can have a score right next to the media file. You can open different tabs at the same time to compare different scores or different recordings at the same time. It's uh, something that we're used to as uh, ordinary internet users, um, but it's something that becomes particularly important uh, when I was working with my own topic. So um, the other major factor in my embrace of the web format was that uh, like many artistic researchers, my audience is not only in academy. So 
I want to reach fellow artists that have nothing to do with the university. Um, of course, many of the people I work with, they like to read, they go to the library, they read magazines and so on and so forth. And they might be interested in discourse and talking about things, but they're not used to the whole, um, let's say, the protocol of scholarship using uh, research databases and coming to university libraries. And they may have never heard of something like ProQuest, <laughs> which is the, you know, a big dissertation database. So what's the best way to reach these people? Well, to make a website, just like the way that you would want to reach anyone else in any other domain. Um, having an open access website uh, means that I'm naturally going to be dovetailing with the habitual knowledge circuits of uh, people who are hungry for information and materials in this topic of mine, uh, but don't ordinarily you know, visit the typical places that academics would. So those are, those are the two big factors in my embrace of the web format. And the structure of the dissertation is like so. So it's divided into uh, one, two, three, four, five, five main chapters with uh, an introduction, which I call chapter zero, and a kind of conclusion, which I call omega. And the reason that they're not called chapter one and chapter seven is because uh, the chapters are not meant to be read in a linear order. So you'll notice that the order that's showing up right now on the home page is path zero, then it goes to path five, path two, path four, ending with path omega. Path is another way of saying chapter, because again, I just wanted to avoid this model of chapter one, two, three, four, five, from left to right. And I think of the paths as, as being ways of getting through the arguments of the dissertation as a whole. And you can go in different directions and different orders and so forth. So when I refresh the page, da -da 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 -da, get a different order. Path zero stays at the beginning and path omega stays at the end. But the idea there being that you can kind of start and end wherever you like. And this is something that I learned through the process of putting the website together that there's certain things that uh, the web format has to offer that I didn't necessarily plan into the structure of the dissertation, but through the process of playing with uh, you know, different platforms and different, um, different tools, I learned that it had uh, things to contribute not only to the presentation of the arguments, but the structure of the thinking of the website itself. And so these little icons up here are representing the same thing. And you can click on those or you can click on these to get to, to a path. And when you go into the path, you have, on the far left side, you have tags. Everybody's familiar with how tags work that are common to various chapters. So here are all the bits where graphic notation is discussed. And then you have a column of text here, which goes, in some cases, quite a long way down the page. And as you'll notice, there's a media library on the right, which stays put as I scroll down the page. Uh, this is, again, uh, a simple technical opportunity that ended up forming an important part of um, the structure of the text itself. Because often, um, you see media files integrated into web texts as stationary points in a text. So instead of scrolling down the text and having the media, li media library separate on the right-hand side, you might scroll down, and, and I'll be talking about piece X, and at the end of this paragraph, 
you have a little player, a video player or an audio player or an image, much like you would in a printed document. But the problem with that is that um, basically you're using material as figures, as support for the text somehow, or as an object of discussion. And this is something that, um, as an artistic researcher, I wanted to avoid. I wanted to have the reader to have equal access to the verbal text and to the media at the same time, because they're often commenting on one another. It's not a hierarchical relationship. Um, in some chapters, um, I have mainly media making the argument. I'll show you an example here. This chapter is about the music of Malcolm Goldstein. He's a Canadian composer, uh, rather an American composer performer now living in Montreal. And he's very interested in the physicality of playing, the physicality of instruments, and the tactility of notation. And uh, the main meat of this chapter is actually a documentary film. The text here, on the left-hand side, is basically just unpacking the problems that are explored more deeply in the film. So you'll notice this is much shorter than the text in the previous path I was showing you. And then it's preparing the reader, so to speak, uh, for watching the video. This is a 30-minute documentary. Um, so there's, there, there's really a heavy weight in this chapter towards multimedia and away from the verbal text. And to put uh, a video player within the scrolling text, I think would do a major disservice to, to the user experience in that respect, because basically um, you're reading this little preview, and then you have the video, and if you want to finish reading the preview or you want to refer to the preview as you're watching the video, uh, you can't. You're basically stuck with wherever you are at a static position on the page. So as I was dreaming up the structure of the dissertation, uh, this became very important because it'll, it forced me to think not only about uh, balancing the different media and integrating them in different ways conceptually, but um, about how to present them physically so that people would be able to um, understand the kinds of tension that I'm exploring or the, the mutual influence, so to speak, of audio, video scores, and the verbal texts. And this becomes important uh, in a chapter like number three, path number three, which is a chapter about um, a fluxus piece called Variations for Double Bass. And the score here is uh, verbal notation as well. So basically, it's just a series of instructions for actions you do with the, with the bass. It's uh, typical of the genre of uh, the fluxus event score, in the sense that everything is uh, just written in plain language. And the, the real task as a performer to realize these pieces is um, to perform the actions. And then you discover kind of what the piece is really about for doing it. So there's a, an interesting relationship here that could be developed between the score as, as a sort of set of explanations or a set of instigations and the explanatory text, which is in a way doing the same thing. So it starts with a fairly conventional uh, kind of academic introduction to the piece and the kinds of problems that I think the piece can help unravel. And it describes uh, my experience in playing the piece and later on in the text, way down there, the last section of the piece is actually a set of performance instructions for the reader. This is one of the longer texts in the dissertation. Uh, 
It is now very late at night, and so I am having funny ideas. This is where the section starts, uh, which kind of interweaves analytical reflections uh, with performance instructions uh, for the reader. And the idea is that it's uh, sort of picking up where the main analytical text leaves off and uh, encouraging the reader to kind of experience what it's like uh, to make a piece or to perform a piece like this. It's very difficult sometimes to describe that uh, without having done it. And so this piece is sort of playing with that edge between uh, sort of analysis and performance. So lines like this above number two, iron your favorite flag, are embedded within text where I'm describing the problems involved with realizing a variation where he asks you to plant a local flag in the ground, something like this. Um, so again, this is um, having the score here to read as a score next to the analytical text. Being able to go back and forth is something um, that the web allows you to do very easily. And it contributed to my concept of how this chapter was going to be developed. This is something that I probably would not have been able to do very effectively in, in a bound book. If I'm interested in people comparing these two kinds of texts side by side, I can do it from one page to the other. Maybe I could do one page of the score, one page of analytical text, and do that for a few more pages, but you don't have the kind of mobility to go back and forth between those two texts, and so the tension that you can explore between these different modes is just not there. This is something that uh, the web allowed me to do, made me think about, so it's, it influenced the research process as much as it allowed me to present it in the way that I thought would be most effective. So, um, and then, you know, in addition to having, uh, you know, the scores, single scores, single recordings and so forth, uh, this media gallery allows you to compare things in a way that I think is, um, is quite fruitful. You can create uh, not only um, a sort of sh showcase for the media, but you can assemble different bits and organize them in such a way that it, it gives clarity to things that weren't so clear. And that would be the case in a chapter like this one. So this was a series of pieces um, by a composer named Bob Ostertag called Say No More. And it's a little difficult to get your head around exactly what the relationship of these pieces is. Um, and how, and how notation works within these pieces. Uh, but the media library actually makes it very easy in a way. So the deal is that uh, Bob Ostertag uh, asked a group of improviser friends to send him solo recordings. So there's solo drums, vocals, and bass, all made independently of each other. He collected them, chopped them up, and created a kind of collage of different bits and pieces of these solo improvisations put together as a virtual band, like sort of a surrealistic virtual band. And that was the first version. And then for the second version, he transcribed this, gave it back to the performers, brought them all together physically, and said, play what you hear. And the notation was kind of a roadmap to doing that. Um, of course, the, the whole game with this piece is that uh, the performers are not able to do that, and they end up creating another kind of experience by impersonating themselves and attempting this impossible feat. And uh, then, of, then that was recorded. He chopped it up again, made a third version, so that the third version was a tape piece, then transcribed that again, gave it back to the performers, and they did a fourth piece together. So it's like these constant little feedback loops. And uh, this material, the, the notation had never been published. And the records were presented in such a way that it was difficult to understand what the relationship was to one another, just because of the way it was named and the way it was archived and so on and so forth. Um, 
But the way it's organized here makes that much clearer. So you have a record which consists of two pieces at the beginning, one A and one B. You have two A and two B. Remember, one A and one B are tape pieces. Two A and two B are live pieces that are derived from one A and one B. And then you have three and four, which work the same way. Three is a single piece, which is derived from uh, 2a and 2b, and then four is derived from three. And the scores, um, which, as you can see, are not, they're not really prepared for perpetuity. <laughs> they were kind of sketch maps that were given to the performers, and they did their best to make sense of it through conversation and so forth, but it was never meant to be a kind of a standalone document. So you can, you can follow these with the different recordings here uh, in a way that wasn't possible to do before and also would have been difficult if we divided the print material from the audio material as you would with an ordinary print thesis. So things that the web makes very easy. Um, this is the basic structure of the dissertation. Before I, I carry on, are there any questions, curiosities? Yeah? You can play one and see the score at the same time. True thing. Unfortunately, for technical reasons, we have no audio. Oh, that's right. Oh, oh no. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but it's very easy. What you would do is you would open a file here. Actually, first what I would do is I'd open PDF here. In another window. Let me close these. And then you open this guy. Press play. And then you have the score side by side in another tab. Yeah. If you want to spot check, then you just use the scroll bar burp, and navigate a PDF the way you would. Yeah, and if you yeah. have the right extensions, you can split it into two side by side things. Correct. Yeah. It's not rocket science, but it has a, a profound impact on the sorts of arguments you can make and the kinds of structures that you can, can embed in your research. Anybody else so far? Okay. So uh, now what I'd like to do is just uh, briefly discuss how I went about it, kind of what was, the, what was the workflow, what were the problems, what are the tools, and uh, what I would recommend if anyone else is interested in this kind of thing. So um, there's, there are no real standard practices for this kind of thing, as I had mentioned before. Uh, dis digital dissertations have been around a while, but technology changes every day, and um, dissertations uh, are still generally required in print at most universities. Some will accept both. Some will only accept the print, and the web itself is considered kind of an appendix. It varies from place to place and institution to institution. I'm lucky because <laughs> my, my, my advisors and uh, other pioneers in this field did all the dirty work before me, and they had to deal with uh, administrative positions through which these things would not get passed. They would not accept the web dissertation at all. And, and you know, half the dissertation was writing it, and the other half was just pushing it through all this bureaucratic bullshit. So um, it still hasn't really become, uh, again, a standardized thing or a way of working with best practices or with, with uh, common tools and things. And you have to figure out the best way to do it for you. Um, the first tool I looked at which is something you probably know, is called the research catalog. Um, can I have a show of hands who has explored this before? Really? Okay, well this is, um, this is a platform 
for building multimedia research ex expositions, as they're called, and is used uh, to build a number of digital publications, like the Journal of Artistic Research. If you want to publish on, in this journal, you have to make your exposition, and you have to submit it to them directly from within this platform. Um, let me just get in, and I'll show you what this looks like. So you make a profile uh, with your bio, your picture, typical things like this. And as soon as you have um, a profile, which by the way, anyone can get who's an artistic researcher, it's free, um, then you can go and you can make an exposition. So I click on create exposition. I enter a bunch of metadata. <laughs> and I'm presented with this. It's Canvas for building a website. Um, it's very intuitive in the sense that you simply select an object, like say I want to put some text here. I click in the text, I can change the font if I want. I can change the font size, and so on and so forth. And I can do it, all of this without knowing any code. Uh, similarly, I can pull media objects over here from the toolbar, plop them down, and I can upload a JPEG. And there it is. Very straightforward. It, you, you can host the media there as well. And you can do that with audio and video and so on and so forth. Uh, there is, however, a big problem, which is this is the only way to build a website in this platform. So typical things like uh, CSS files, which is basically what every website in the universe uses for styling, so typography, layouts, color schemes, all of this is normally controlled from a central document called the CSS style sheet. And if you want to change the body font, for a whole website, you just go to the style sheet and you change it there. If you want to change the title styles or the size of the margins, you do it in CSS. And practically every website in existence uses the CSS, but not the research catalog. And so there's a number of things that you can't do with the research catalog. And one of those things is uh, the sticky media gallery. Um, this, by sticky, I mean it stays in one place while you scroll down the text, yeah? And, and this became very important to me as I was thinking about these issues. I want to present the media with the same importance as the verbal text, and I want the reader to, to be able to access them at all times. And you can't do that, because basically you're just dealing with these static objects. If I had CSS, I could do it, but the system doesn't allow for it. And... Um, I mean, there, there are reasons that they can't do that because they wanted to make this format accessible to people with absolutely zero experience or skills in coding. And they also wanted the look at the, the, um, the layout and the look and the typography and all this stuff to be absolutely stable over time. So they are very concerned about the permanence of the research and stability and these kind of conventional values uh, in print publishing, which they were trying to adapt for digital publishing in, in order to have a sort of um, legitimacy within their domain that they didn't have before. And that's respectable, but it creates a lot of problems. And the sticky sidebar is just the beginning, because here we're also working with um, fixed uh, screen layouts. So I can set the text here, I can set uh, the media here, but it's going to look the same on all devices. It's just proportion. And so the text, if you try to look at it on a smartphone, is totally illegible. It's so small, right? Or if you um, are playing with uh, different, si different um, 
different kinds or different directions of navigation. For example, if you want to go left to right in addition to go up and down, then it just compounds the problem because you're looking at a canvas that might be you know, 2,000 pixels wide, but you're looking at it on a phone like this. <laughs> it's just completely unusable. And so you're kind of bound to look at these things through, through desktops. There's no scaling like most modern websites have where it changes the layout depending on the size of the device. So working with um, the research catalog, which is, I should say, also very, it's a positive thing because there's a lot of other people working with the research catalog and it, and it functions kind of as a social network as well. Um, so I'll just go back. Um, there's thousands of people using this and you have access to their research and you can search through different topics or uh, different institutions and so on and so forth. So it has something going for it, but the interface itself was a drag. And so I bypassed it. But it, but it was interesting through the process of playing with this and discovering these kinds of, of limitations that kind of opened my mind a bit more to, to the possibilities of the web format that I wasn't really aware of because I'm not a sophisticated programmer. I, don't really, I didn't really know the ins and outs of web design well enough to imagine uh, you know, how my research could be adapted for this format. So it's a process of uh, you know, sort of playing in the sandbox, figuring out what you can do. Even though you don't have a background in this field, you bumble around and by virtue of finding things that don't work, you find things that do work. So that, that's an important lesson I can share. If you're interested in this kind of thing, um, it's worth digging around in the dirt and, and making these kinds of mistakes. So um, the platform that I ultimately adapted is, is WordPress. Um, do people familiar with WordPress? This is the most popular web building platform. And the way it works, I'll just sign into hotelpass.net slash, what is it, slash WP login dot PHP. So WordPress is what they call a CMS, content management service, and um, basically you upload all of your content here through WordPress. WordPress uploads it and organizes it for you where your website is hosted, and it also um, gives you all the styling opportunities and uh, kind of keeps all of the technical information sorted for you. So you sign in to WordPress, and if you want to create content, you can do it as a post or as a page. You go into the post, and this is where I have my, my chapters. And what pops out is uh, what you call um, a what you see is what you get editor. So you put your text up here. You can format it here much the way you would in a Word document. So you can have the bold text. You can have um, you know, different headings, you can change the fonts, all this sort of stuff. Um, and then WordPress converts it into HTML. You can you know, then upload your media to the media gallery, create a featured image, and all this is done from within the dashboard of WordPress. And um, you know, there's a reason this is popular because it's, it's quite robust. You can do all kinds of things. Um, also, it's very, very popular, so there's a lot of support for it. And it's easy to adapt templates of what other people have done and change them to your taste. So, uh, you know, by virtue of its ubiquity, you can do practically anything you want with it. Uh, the tricky part about WordPress, well, there's various tricky parts about WordPress. Um, the first is that, um, the styling, once you want to go beyond a certain level, 
can get very technical. So you do need to be able to write your own CSS, and then you also need to use other tools like Java and PHP and all kinds of stuff that I don't understand. So um, as I started playing with the web design, after this initial hurdle of the research catalog, it became pretty clear that um, if I was going to come up with anything worthwhile, I needed to work with a proper designer. And thankfully, I had uh, quite forward-thinking and, and generous supervisors who saw that need and, and recognized my argument that research catalog wasn't going to cut it. And so they offered me funding to pay a web designer, which I realize is quite a luxury. But it ended up making an enormous difference. Uh, again, not only in the aesthetic appeal of the website, uh, but in the collaboration that it um, promoted between me and the designer. It wasn't just someone that I was you know, paying to make this thing as, as quickly and slickly as possible, but there was actually time for me to get together with her and talk about the structure of things like the media gallery and how the table of contents would be represented and all of these um, all of these aspects of the user experience that, that come back into the research process itself and force me to think about the content in a particular way. Um, so uh, WordPress was also uh, a bit tricky for things like footnote management. This is a technical thing uh, that you wouldn't think is such a big deal, but uh, footnotes online can be actually quite tricky. Uh, because, you know, you have a long text, you can't flip back and forth between the last page of the chapter and where you are to check up a reference. You can't go to the bottom of the page to read a footnote and then just return to the body of the text. Basically, footnotes have got to be um, outside the main body of the text, and there aren't very many obvious tools for dealing with this. Um, what we ended up doing was using a plugin for the footnotes, which looks pretty good, in my opinion, um, and is fairly functional. You have every footnote here in a little gray circle, and then it shows the content there. And if you click it, you go to the bottom. And then you can get back where you were with an arrow. The problem with this, though, was the management itself, because um, it requires special, sh what's called short code, in the body of the text. And this becomes very clumsy, because as I'm writing the text, I'm not writing it in short code. And it creates another layer of work to insert the short codes. And of course, I'm bound to make mistakes and overlook things, so it becomes a longer process of revision, as opposed to just preparing something on a Word doc. Um, and then uh, the other bit about WordPress that I haven't come up against yet is that uh, I'm working with uh, third-party tools. So, what's, what, you know, plugins that other people have developed uh, in order to do things like these footnote conversion or the media gallery and stuff like this. And these need to be updated over time because the, not all the plugins are going to work together in such an obvious way, or they might, the development might stop, and it might no longer be compatible with new versions of the WordPress, CMS, and so on and so forth. So using a system like this um, requires maintenance over time. Again, I've had no problems yet. I haven't had to, to make any changes, but I'm prepared for the day when that's going to happen. And this is just the nature of of websites in general, for example, um, my, my advisor's, my supervisor's dissertation, which he made in 2001, uh, requires Flash, which is a plugin that has gone the way of the dodo bird, basically. You can still get it in certain browsers, but it's not a contemporary tool. And uh, so some people who want to read this dissertation have to, have to you know, install Flash which is not a big deal in and of itself, but sometimes you have incompatibilities with modern browsers and stuff like that. So this, this is one of the negative aspects of, of using this kind of a system, which is composed of so many bits and pieces. Um, 
Also, uh, an important part of the web design for my supervisors was that the media files not be hosted uh, on third-party providers like SoundCloud, Vimeo, YouTube, and so on and so forth. This is a point that the research catalog people make rather vehemently is that they, you want to be able to host all of your content there so you're not at the mercy of these companies once they get bought up by whoever and uh, the, the technical aspects change or maybe the company ceases to exist and so forth. And so everything is hosted on, uh, on my server, which again is fine. It's a little extra work, um, but the downside there is that uh, I'm not connected to all of the other people who are looking at the same content in SoundCloud or looking at it in Vimeo, because these are also social networks in the way that you know, the research catalog is a social network. You know, people will add your files to their playlists, will, will do their likes. I mean, it's a bit frivolous, but it's important if you want to get people interested in your research who are already interested in the artistic content, then this is a lost opportunity, so to speak, when you forego these kinds of services which are already connected. So, um, yeah, what would I do if I could do it again? What would I do differently, rather? Um, what I'm mostly interested in these days is, uh, for purposes of web design and things, is a, is a service called, a piece of software, rather, called Hugo, which is very interesting. It's, it's a static website generator. And it's different from something like WordPress, because WordPress is what you call a dynamic website system. And that means that um, the content can change depending on the reader's data. So it can incorporate things like advertising or blog comments, things like this. Whereas what a static website does is it's just HTML files with, with the corresponding CSS that just stay there the same forever. And so you're not dependent on uh, things like plugins, it's much faster, it's much lighter. And it, the learning curve is a little bit steeper because it's meant for web developers, but it's, um, it's quite robust because basically you're writing everything in uh, text files. You don't have to put it into Word and format it manually. You use what's called a markdown. Does anybody here use markdown? Yeah, so Markdown is basically just, um, it's a very simple a plain text markup. Let's see if I can I'll find you a Markdown file. Um, I basically write all of my articles in Markdown nowadays. Um, looks like this. So you use a, just a normal text editor, and then uh, there are little signs that you use to tell another program how to convert it into other formats like PDF or doc or HTML or LaTeX or any of these other text markup languages. Um, so here you have the title, you have the author, and you have the date. And that information will be embedded when I want to export it to any of those other formats. <clears throat> you, a hash mark is simply a header, heading rather. So one is heading one, it's the biggest, the most important, and then you have subheadings with two hash marks, sub-subheading with three hash marks, and so forth. And then you can embed references in the text that refer to BibTeX files. Does anybody work with BibTeX or LaTeX? Yeah, computer people. <laughs> this is actually the standard in the hard sciences uh, less so in the social sciences, but in the humanities, it's not a popular tool, but it's a very robust way to work. So basically, BibTeX is um, it's a bibliography, bibliography um, archive kind of language. It stores all of your bibliography in plain text, and then uh, you use other programs to format the bibliographies for you automatically. It's very slick, and it's foolproof. Um, so what you can do is you can, you can connect BibTeX with... Uh, markdown using language like this and it spits out um, a bibliography at the end of the text when you convert it to the other format. Uh, things like 
Italics are represented with asterisks at the beginning and end of whatever you want to italicize. Or bold is with two asterisks. Uh, you can also specify quotes by using the caret. And then footnotes are inserted uh, in between square brackets with a caret. Even though I've inserted the body of the footnote right below it, the final document will come out with the footnote at the end. So automation is, is golden here. And the structure of the text is perfectly clear without having to fiddle with the, uh, the formatting of you know, what exactly does the font look like for my heading and what's the spacing look like in my ordered lists and things like this. It makes a big difference when working on a project as big as a dissertation because it's extremely easy to organize and uh, the structure is clear even though you're bypassing all that other aesthetic information. So it's, I don't know about you, but I found myself when I used to work with word of you know, sort of killing time between writing by you know, adjusting the fonts or where does this paragraph sit at the bottom of the page or at the beginning of the next page. And I, it took me a long time to figure out that I had this nasty habit and how much time I was actually wasting. Uh, but if you write things like this in, in Markdown with a plain text editor, you don't have those kind of distractions. It's like flushing your cell phone down the toilet. You know, it's like <laughs> you just eliminate all of those distractions. So what's wonderful is that you, with, with a website generator like Hugo, is that you actually use Markdown in the body of the files that get uploaded to your website. And Hugo converts them to HTML. And there they stay. Um, so uh, the question of maintenance and stability is like a whole different ballgame. It's a little more advanced in the sense that you, you don't have a what you see is what you get editor. What you have to do is you have to prepare the texts and give a certain amount of technical information to Hugo. Um, and then it will generate the final files that get uploaded to the website. So you have to learn the ropes with, with some of these uh, basic technical problems, but you don't actually have to be a coder to get it right. There's a lot of very beautiful themes that you can download, um, and they're, they're quite easy to modify without a technical background. And there's, there's terrific support as well, because it's, it's web developers who have who have invented this and who are a member of the community. So it's easy to get a response from them. It's not a commercial service. It's like it's open source and it's free. So these are kind of some of my thoughts um, about why I did this and how I did it and what sorts of things you might like to think about. Um, the hour is already up, actually, but um, talk to me. You mean how does the institution do it? Or? Yeah, for, you know, if I submit my thesis in one year time, I probably can ensure this website is functioning for a few years. Mm -hmm. How do you keep this continuity like a printed version for more than a decade? Um, and also, you mentioned about you store everything in your own server. And you have to responsibility to, to maintain your own server with pricing and everything. I have to, well, yeah, I already have to pay for it anyway because of my personal website yes. and other projects, so it's not really a big deal. If I were to get run over by a truck on the way home tonight, I don't know what would happen, actually. <laughs> I, would, I, would have to, uh, I would have to think about that. Um, I haven't gotten that far. Um, what, would, what, what would you do? I, this is things I think I would be, be criticized from, from my future external examiner or they were asking me if I, I can submit a mission. For example, if you submit a DVD, technician will try to find a very old DVD player to make it happen. Yeah. If I submit a website, do you, the school has to, in theory, they have to archive 
a computer with the <laughs> data version. But then the website is not become really open access to the internet. It become like isolated itself, become like a digital support, like a, like a DVD somehow. Yeah, well I mean I have it backed up as a zip file. And so, um, I suppose maybe the, the most foolproof way to do that would be just to burn it on a CD and uh, keep it for people with technical information about when it was made and the kinds of browsers that we use and so on and so forth. Um, I haven't gotten to that point. I, I, I think you should make a video of yourself reading it just in real time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that said, I also, made a, I also made a print version. I sort of, um, I didn't want to fight that battle. The university asked for a print version, and so I made them a print version, and that was fine. But it's not the real thing, and, and, and there's no media in there. It's just a formality. It feels like there's a, there's a kind of plan B-ness to this, that there's an institutional responsibility for there, be, for there to be a, a plan B, that this is the version you want to work up here, but should technical things go in different directions and that becomes unusable, even though... Well, not so much tactile paths, but the Markdown version is much more future-proof than tactile paths. Yeah, but exactly. The still always has the PDF version, so the uh, a chunk of the research will always exist. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, this is this is not just a a problem that academics have. It's yeah. like <laughs> this this is a problem that everyone has, from engineers to artists to whomever you know. I, I, know, I met a guy on the airplane recently who's, uh, he calls himself a plastician. He's a scientist who's an expert in plastics. And he was on his way to a conference at the Getty in the States, which was all about how to deal with the, the, the physical decadence of a number of artworks from the 70s that were made of plastic. They were disintegrating. <laughs> and I thought to myself, shit, you know, who would have thought of that? Of, of all the things that would, th that would stay on the earth forever, you would think something so toxic and, and artificial as plastic would stand the test of time, but it doesn't. And so these artworks are falling apart, and he's going there to consult with the curators about, well, what are we going to do? Do we actually need to save it, or is the disintegration part of the deal? And, and maybe, maybe it's the same with scholarship. You know, I think it's... <laughs> We, we like to kid ourselves by saying it will be there forever, but <laughs> things always need to be changed and updated and edited and rebound and repackaged and rethought. So why shouldn't, why shouldn't dis web dissertations work the same way? Yeah. yeah. Not just her own thing, you mean as a general researcher? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what his thesis is, but he is looking at, he is, a, 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 I think, a curator rather than an archivist, mm. but he is focusing on how do we archive and store digital yeah. media. So, um, at least with something like the Markdown mm. version, it's in readable text. So it's always just a question of getting it translated. If WordPress gets pulled up by someone else tomorrow, that's it, it might just all go. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that happening, though. I mean, it's, it's like... It's, MySpace. It's, MySpace, right. But, I don't know, like, is something like Google going to disappear tomorrow? <laughs> it will change, but it's like... It's, it's certainly a trade-off, you know? I mean, you have to... You have to balance questions of access and um, speed and so forth with questions of permanence and stability. Research catalog, if I had put my dissertation there, it would, it would be there if I got run over by a truck and didn't pay my dream host fees for this year. And that's an advantage, huh? Dreamhost is my hosting yeah, service. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but at the same time, I would have never been able to do what I wanted to do. So I'm, I'm willing to take that risk and just roll with the dangers of the medium. Yeah. By the way, the archiving thing reminds me there's something you might want to check out. Um, I'm going to assemble some links for you that will get posted on a 
website yeah, of some on, sort. On the separate website. Um, but the whole, you know, the whole business of archiving is like, that's a whole other branch of possibilities for the web that I don't really know much about. But, you know, the digital humanities field is obsessed with these questions, you know. But uh, I found a website that I found was very interesting. It was actually a, a dissertation or an appendix to a dissertation by a Chinese historian who was studying uh, advertising in China. And she had this enormous collection of, of artifacts from you know, uh, uh, press ads and photos and sketches and maps and so forth, uh, which she assembled throughout her research that obviously couldn't all make it into the final print document. But she wanted to make this available to other researchers and to, to get the researchers who were interested in this kind of material to discover her dissertation. And so she's built a, a website called Madspace where all of this stuff is assembled, and you can search through the stuff orthogonally. And, and I thought that was also like a very, it's another advantage of working with the web that I didn't talk about, but could be very interesting in the context of artistic research, people who are working with archives, people who are working with larger sets of data, and so on and so forth. It's a powerful tool for that as well. It seems like a lot of these kind of tools are out there, and always there are future proofing as always. It's permanently in question. Everyone tries their best. Um, any more questions about this? Yeah. Um, could you talk a bit about how, um, or if the, the presentation format has informed your research process, and if so, how? Good question. Uh, yes, absolutely. I talked a bit about that before. So, I mean, discovering the presentation format brought me to the conclusion that I wanted to have these media files and the verbal text accessible at all times, right? So this, this is a decision about how to represent the material. But uh, later on in the process of, the, of writing the dissertation, when I had decided on, on that representation, but I hadn't finished writing the content, there were certain kinds of problems and possibilities that it really pinpointed. And the chapter uh, about Ben Patterson's piece is exactly one of those cases. So. Um, you know, I knew that I had these previous performances of, of the piece that I wanted to put there on the website, and I knew I wanted to write about them and describe the process of preparing it and performing it and so on and so forth. Um, but there was kind of, um, th th there was a conclusion missing in this plan somehow, and I wasn't quite sure how to wrap up the chapter, and it was at that point that I decided, well, maybe the most effective way to to conclude this chapter would be to actually take the reader on kind of a phenomenological journey through this kind of material, through these verbal instructions and so on and so forth. And that's something that I would have never attempted if I didn't realize that I could have the score up there for them to go back and forth the whole time. That's one case, no? But um, even before I knew what the website was going to look like at the end, and, and I was in the early phases, like when I was working on the documentary film, um, knowing that I could put a film there, just in very basic terms, meant that I could make the film also the centerpiece, that people would be able to see the whole thing, would be able to see that on their screens and wouldn't have to, you know, futz around with the DVD and so on and so forth, that it would be as easily accessible as the text that I could give it more weight in the argument itself. And I could kind of build in uh, the results of the research into the film itself, as opposed to making an artistic artifact and just talking about it in the verbal text. And um, yeah, there's lots of other examples like this. Actually, I've written an article about um, this experience of making tactile paths and the kinds of lessons that would be important for others that are also working with web-based dissertations, which will be coming out in a very interesting publication. Um, I wanted to show that to you. Um, it's going to come out later this year. It's edited by uh, people in literature, actually. Virginia Kuhn and Kate, Kathy Gossett, they're interested in digital publishing as a research topic. So they have a lot more sophisticated um, opinions and ideas about this field than I do. I'm just talking to you as a, as a fellow artistic researcher who's lugged through it and, and has some useful information, but these people uh, dedicated their scholarly careers to it. So um, it's very interesting. It's like a whole 
bunch of different scholars. There's people from different areas of the humanities. Um, you have historians, you have art people, literature people, designers, uh, digital humanities people. I'm, I'm actually the lone artistic researcher here, but I've written an article where I kind of talk more in detail about the, the, the process of how, how these technical aspects fed you know, general concepts of representation, how the representation uh, encouraged a certain type of reflection on the research process, and so on and so forth. So if, if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to forward that to you. Yeah.